probably the most single most important day in the AI world was the 30th of November 2022, when OpenAI launched their first GPT model publicly. That shift to LLMs, or large language models, um, has completely altered the paradigm in which AI operates. And AI software providers, and AI technologists, and AI practitioners, it has changed everything. Right, well, I've got a challenge for you that we um, didn't prepare for, but I was talking the rate to somebody, and he said, look, oh, these panels, everyone agrees, they're just a little bit dull. So the one that he likes best is when we have some uh, confrontations. So our challenge, our challenge is to, uh, Darren, if you're still there, uh, keep Darren, to Darren entertaining with a bit of, bit of um, challenge. But um, our challenge is to, is to talk about AI with some real success stories. A lot of people talk about AI. Um, we actually want to kind of, some real examples. Uh, so just to kick things off, just to, I'll just do very short introductions. Natalie, we think we've heard about Salesforce already, so I think we can save you from explaining who Salesforce is. Lisa, key insurance, billion pounds, not dollars, Supreme, I got that right? Dollars. Dollars, billion dollars, maybe a pound this next year. Mm -hmm. Algorithmic underwriter, most people know about you. Uh, and then John, you are looking at data ingestion and extraction. That good enough for now, just so everyone knows. I would also say I'm from the number one startup in Europe, according to the Financial Times. Wow, number yeah. one in Europe. Yeah. Number two on LinkedIn. But. Right. Well, I mean, you're going to go one place. You're going to go down. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. Gosh, I didn't know that. Right. Okay, Lisa. AI. It can mean all sorts of different things. So, for the purposes of tonight, um, how would you like us to be discussing AI? Yeah, um, absolutely. And we were actually chatting about this earlier. We were saying how. AI is just kind of a word that's sometimes thrown out there, right? It's a phrase that people kind of overuse. But actually, it's so broad. So really, when we're thinking about it, it's really lots of different tools that you can use for lots of different uses. So it's thinking about the use, really. So really broadly, kind of simplistically, you can break it down to kind of three areas to use it. The first one is really kind of numeric numbers, kind of the traditional way that we think of AI, right? It's kind of uh, synthesizing numbers for either um, prediction or quantitative analysis in that way. The second way that you can kind of think about it is the way we think about text. Um, so it's really, people talk a lot about kind of LLMs, so large language models. And that's really taking lots of different information to either synthesize down, condense, pull information from text, or produce code is another way. The last kind of way that I can really think about it is kind of some of those more um, uh, sophisticated sides of things of either reading or producing images. So broadly, you can kind of put it into those buckets when you're thinking about it. Fantastic. Um, which one are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, the first two. The first two. Let's go on those ones. Yeah. But it's a really important point, because this word AI gets bandied around a lot. And it, before, a couple of years ago, before people discovered chat GPT, it meant one thing. Now it's often a shorthand for generative AI and chat GPT and all the other great things out there. But it's important to make that distinction. So just to ground it in reality then, um, what would be a couple of examples that you could share with us from what you're doing at Key for how you're using one of those first two applications? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Key, everyone will know or may know, so they'll give a bit of background really came in as a startup in 2020 and it was trying to challenge the market in how we can use technology to underwrite better, to, to do a better job, select better risks. And Key is founded in how do we codify and use machine learning to select risks. So we use it as part of our foundation as selecting grading risks, selecting line size and manage our portfolios. But really in key, it's beyond that. It's actually the entire process and how you use it throughout the company as well. And so I can think of a couple of examples that really bring that to life. And when we think about using AI, we think about, yes, that underwriting process, but also operational efficiencies that we can think there, gaining more information as well to enhance it. And so within key, a couple of examples of really good use cases is we have a version of chat GPT called chat, GP, key. There are lots of puns in key. <laughs> That's what we like doing. And what that does is it uses large language models and connects essentially the individuals across the company. So it doesn't matter what area you're in to all the information across key. So with your data lake, your emails, your documents, your files, your folders, your notion pages, 
and you can write it much like you would anything else in ChatGPT, but pull that information internally. So it suddenly streamlines and gives information at the touch of a button to someone. Uh, other ways is around using it to help those within the company. We have some really tech-savvy coders, bring them into the forefront, but also opens it up to everyone in the company. The other way that I mentioned two examples was around using LLMs to essentially gather more information. And so both on a numeric side and a tech side, on the numeric side, using Excel and bringing those. So we already mentioned SOVs, schedule of values, come in lots of different formats. And so using LLMs, it can read those Excel files. It can get them into a structured, consistent format, saving time, but also creating better data. And similarly, we've used it as well for reading slips. So I, one example I can give is looking for whether there's exclusions, terms, gaining that data, but gaining that data at kind of your fingertips and doing it in a way where it pulls it automatically and it streamlines that, that, that whole process. Right, good examples. Just quick clarification on the first one or yeah. what was the reason why you did that. So yeah. you, could, you could have the choice to enable ChatGPT or Gemini. Mm kind of answering my own question, but is the reason you have chat? GP key. GP yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> no, because, it's, because you want to make sure it's only pulling in certain information. You don't want the risk of hallucination because it's going out and bringing in all sorts of other stuff. Or, or um, It's more so that we can use it internally, um, and it's more so that we can essentially uh, control and own what it's looking at. And you're absolutely right about hallucinations and make sure we control that. Um, we have a team who own and work on that so we can absolutely control the information and we can hone it over time to the information within Key. Right, the dream killers or something. Okay, uh, Natalie, so we want to come back to Salesforce. So, so you, you, in a sense, maybe a different type of client, maybe similar client, but not everyone can build their own version of chat, GPT, GPT, GPT. How, how, do you, how are you building, how are you working with some of these large language models within Salesforce to give that, you know, give that sort of simpler access to people? Or maybe there's a version where people are actually writing their own code as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, there's probably two main ways we're helping our customers embed AI within their organizations. The first one is that we're offering an open platform. So that means they can bring in their external data, structured and unstructured, and they can also bring in their own models or large language models if they did happen to build or fine tune their own as well. So we're grounding our AI uh, experiences in external sources that we may not have been able to do in the past. So that's the first part. The second part then is enabling that in the flow of work. So people have been using Salesforce for 26 years. They have well-established interfaces, workflows, channels for service setup. So what's really important is that we're surfacing AI insights in those experience that, experiences that are already well embedded. So that could be data visualizations, that could be generating things like replies in chat conversations, um, wrap up summaries at the end of a call. So I worked with a customer that it used to take them 15 minutes per call to write up all the notes, get it saved, uh, pick up the next actions that needed to happen. That's now down to one to two minutes per call. So across thousands of calls per day, the savings there are absolutely exponential. Um, in terms of driving revenue, we're doing things like creating POVs, creating closed plans, summarizing accounts, using business logic to make sure that we're only displaying the top opportunities or the highest priority cases. So it's using everything that Salesforce has spent 26 years establishing in um, our platform, um, but bringing that to the surface in these um, market-leading AI experiences. Okay, well, I'm gonna crack at POVs. So POC, I know, proof of concept, POV, proof of value. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay. Well, just uh, so let's just take that example then. Um, so just to make sort of explore it a little bit more. So someone's using Salesforce. They want to look at a proof of value, which is same as proof of concept, essentially. Is that or something? So like, point of view was the example I was sorry, referring to. Yeah. Sorry. Wrong, then. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so just, yeah, just talk through a point of view then from an example of using a large language model. Of course, yes. Yeah. So I am um, a broker relationship manager and using Salesforce to work out how I can tap into the, some white space in my account. So what I'm going to use is Salesforce uh, conversational in AI interface to read all of the data I know about that customer and the large language model to call all of the data it knows about that customer on the internet and formulate what a 
point of view would be for why they should buy our insurance. Um, so they're taking the insurance details we hold in our knowledge base, the context of the account or opportunity that they're sitting in, and then the information that the large language model has been trained on to create that point of view so that the uh, broker relationship manager can more succinctly go out with the point of view to their customer. And that, that white space was basically the opportunity to sell them more insurance, is that, or they're missing coverage? Yeah, it could, exactly that. So it could be that we offer, as a carrier, six different products, and that broker or that customer is only adopting two of those. So what's the white space that we can start to go after? And <clears throat> how does that work from a cost point of view? Because they've got a Salesforce license. Do they now have to pay more to be able to get this capability, presumably? You have to make revenue somehow. So how does that all stack up for the end customer? Yeah, so we have every customer would have a core license. And then for the customers wanting to launch into these um, generative AI experiences, then we have an add-on license that you can use relevant to the, the core product you're using. Um, they are um, seat-based, so we're not having to worry about consumption. There are limits, as there are with all of the Salesforce products. There, there are governor limits. But these are seat-based, so we're not, we're not worried at this point about consumption. Uh, so John, I just want to come to turn to you now. I'm just thinking about your top, and this has been sitting in the back of my head, I want to make top, top in what, top startup in what, in what category or what? All call? categories. All, ca okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite surprising, yeah. It was great. Well, give me one, just so again, we don't, we don't like to be living life in the abstract, because <laughs> what, what one category you came top in? No, we came number one of all startups in Europe. In all uh, industries, but in in what? But what? How they done? How, sorry, pre 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 billion dollars was the was the so qualified this is criteria. What, fastest growing, most profitable. Yeah, I don't quite know how they're looking. Their their well, best looking, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, ask me a real question. Um, <laughs> right, no, you, if you're going to say you're number one, you've got, I'm afraid if you come on stage up here, you've got to justify it with facts. And we, um, but let's come back to the ingestion one. So there's, there's more and more companies coming up now who are offering services to do ingestion. Key has built their own tools to do it. Um, so what's your sort of advice for organizations that are looking to either build their own or partner with somebody? What, what do they need to think about to get right to, to make that? You know, lots of things you have to get right to do it. But what's your advice to somebody to get it right? Sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the important thing to say and to start with some context building is James from PwC said, this technology is evolving at an incredibly fast pace. Probably the most single most important day in the AI world was the 30th of November 2022 when OpenAI launched their first GPT model publicly. That shift to LLMs, or large language models, um, has completely altered the paradigm in which AI operates. And AI software providers, and AI technologists, and AI practitioners, it has changed everything. Um, it does mean that a lot of the vendors that were on the market maybe two years ago, 18 months ago, a year ago, are already being left behind with technology that may have been based on more natural language processing, the training of models, and everything else around that. Um, so the first thing I would look at, certainly, if you're interested in the, the AI space and how you can utilize it to operationalize AI within your business, um, is focus on providers who are LLM first these days, because the launch of GPT and very quickly followed by Gemini from Google, Anthropic and their Claude, what we call foundation models, um, has totally changed how we should approach AI in the business. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, and, and how, so for those companies that are, were having nice little businesses before November the 31st? 30th. 30th. I think. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> how, fast can they, how fast can they move? Because, I mean, these, the great thing about these tools is that they are accessible to all. You know, so are they catching up quickly? I mean, is this a kind of short-term gap and other people are going to catch up again? Or are, they, are they, those that are LLM first is going to like maintain the lead? In? Oh, I mean, fundamentally, yes. I think all, all companies have to adapt to survive. And certainly, you know, if, you, if your technology business has been built on, I won't say outdated tech, that's totally unfair, but, you know, tech that's not keeping up with where things are, you will very quickly catch up. Um, but the main important points are to note from a buyer perspective is, you, you, I don't know who in this room has experimented with AI within their businesses before, but it may have been based on something where you had to provide training information, you had to sit and label documents for a long time. You know, maybe it would take two or three months to, to spin up a proof of concept. Uh, someone said, I think it was Robin said, 2024 was the, the year of the POC, you know, because it took a long time to do POCs. If you are someone who is now going LLM first with these things, um, and I can give real practical examples of this, a POC should take no longer than one day. Um, you can spin up operational platforms to push live in less than a week. Um, so that is the pace which we should now expect to be operating. And, and, 
I mean, another big barrier for people trying to implement technology, um, be careful who's in the room, is, is the IT department. They go like, you know, no, come back in six months' time. But I mean, presumably that, if you can do fast proof of concept, presumably it's cheap, which means sometimes you can, it's free or you pay by credit card. Yeah, you've also seen that as well. So this is the, the speed of adoption, the sales cycle is much faster because people can, they don't have to go through the pre-POC sign off to do the POC. Yeah, well, well, absolutely correct. I mean, to the extent that V7, the company I work for, you can go to v7labs.com now and start using our product. So we, it's absolutely democratized. In fact, you can get the pro version paying by a credit card um, straight online. So I encourage anyone to go and do that. Um, but yeah, there are still issues that need to be addressed when dealing with you know, large enterprise procurement and everything else. There are security concerns, there are trust concerns, and we mm -hmm. can talk about those. Um, but it is, it is definitely fair to say that its process should, should be accelerated now. It's great to talk about trust then, because it's trust accuracy. You know, this is still a very new technology. People know about hallucinations. How do you make sure that when people are using your tool that they've got complete confidence that what they get back is correct? Or, or maybe just add an, or what's the acceptable error that you would say you, could, you should expect a certain amount of error? Um, so, so I think trust is a, is a broad thing, probably covers three or four different concepts. One is just the accuracy that you're getting back from. Can you, can you trust what it's been said? The second one is hallucinations, where it's actively giving you, I guess, the wrong answer that it's made up. The third one is probably the LLM providers, those foundation model providers, where are they? How are they retaining your data? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And the fourth one is that I've forgotten. Okay. Well, three is good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I, to, to very quickly talk through those, I mean... You don't want to force too many for the audience. Uh, but <laughs> so let's go back to those three. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so on the first one, I mean, it's, it's inherently wrong to say that AI, AI is untrustworthy. Um, you know, if, if you spun up and if you go onto ChatGPT and ask it a question, I bet you nine times out of ten it's getting it right. Um, so we're starting with a baseline of 90% accurate. So compared to a human operator and what their, their results might be, it's actually going to be fairly comparable straight off the bat. Dealing with hallucinations is absolutely a thing. Um, there's probably a couple of ways to address it. The first is really, really high class prompt engineering. And by prompt engineering, we mean the people who are writing those questions to the LLM. How do you structure that question um, to ensure that you can only give it certain bounding boxes to, to give an answer in? But you can also set rules around that as well. You can say, Refer to this library of documents I have. Only give answers that reference this library of documents as your ground truth. Um, or you can force it to give a single select answer to say, you're only allowed to give me one of four answers here. It has to be one of these. So it can't invent an answer for you. Um, on the second point, or the third point, sorry, with, with I guess LLM, sorry, foundation model security themselves, because fundamentally you're giving your data to OpenAI or to Google or whoever. There are ways around that. Um, now we're seeing more and more bring your own key, uh, which effectively means you have a private relationship between your enterprise and the foundation model provider. Um, so OpenAI for Azure, for example, I'm talking about Microsoft, um, that is something you can manage directly with them. And they only have your data and that's it. And that, that's the only way it works. It's not publicly available in any way. There are certain contractual provisions you can put in place as well. Okay, but fantastic. So just, just moving, moving things on. So, so Lisa, just picking up a little bit on this accuracy um, because 90% is fine if someone expects 90%, it's disastrous if they expect 100%. So we've also got to set, set expectations. So with, with your key, not the key you're referring to, <laughs> AI key, um, you're an algorithmic syndicate. You, yeah. By definition, to some extent, you, you've got the algorithm making decisions, but I know you've got people reviewing that. How do you balance that, you know, the, the, both in the kind of the business you're underwriting, but also maybe in the use of some of the... Yeah, LLMs, you know, where, where do you allow the machine to make the decision versus where does someone have to take a look at it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a really important point because I sometimes think when people think about AI, they think it's the solution to everything. And it should be thought of as something which enhances what you do as well. And actually, foundationally, the ethos of Key is that we want to obviously write business in a better way, right, where we follow the Lloyd's market, but we select it by using the best of both worlds, by combining underwriter expertise with technology to help select. And it's exactly that, where you're taking the nuance and the knowledge and the market knowledge of the underwriter, along with the machine learning, the insight, and that additional information. And I can kind of give examples where it will depend on the model itself as to how much oversight. And the model itself will 
only be as intelligent as the data that it's learning from, right? And the, the data that it comes, it comes to your point about kind of the data set that you're giving it in the first place. And so, depending as well on the class of business, some are pretty stable, some in the sense you can uh, create a very reliable machine learning model in that sense, and it can select the risks. And, and others, there will be other aspects outside of that that you want to overlay that underwriting judgment as well. And actually, we have a really streamlined number of underwriters, which um, they are portfolio underwriters, and they kind of look at it holistically. But it's looking at that model input, but also managing the relationships outside. But it's a super important bit to make sure that you understand the models that you're using. And to your point about some of those other use cases as well, it's as well monitoring what's coming out of that, right? So I kind of mentioned uh, either the chat GP key internally. And like you said, having that data set that you know, you, you know if it's wrong or right to a certain extent, you test it, same with the coding and having a bit of knowledge, right? If you just ask chat GPT, even if we go to the original one, about how you write the code, unless you have a little bit of oversight in it, it can be completely wrong. Right? And more importantly, beyond even just that kind of oversight and knowing the limitation of the model, to your point as well, you were mentioning around that kind of um, the hallucinations and, and, and the trust side to it as well. It's also around kind of making sure that what's coming out is morally and ethically right, as well as the explainability of the model. That's super important. We talk about it, and the more advanced Gen AI gets, the more we need to understand the explainability mm -hmm. as well. So I think that's just super important to put over it. Well, I'm very glad we're recording this by video because uh, there's a lot in there, Lisa, that people can then go back and review on the cool. video as well. Um, just given where we are with time, I'm just going to wrap up with one quick question. Um, but Natalie, as your sponsor, you can go last, so you can have a slightly longer question. <laughs> um, so, John, just for the audience, if there's one thing you want them to remember about V7, what should they take away? Or, 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 sorry, V7, or related to this, this topic we're talking about? Um, I think it's fair to say AI from this point forward and into 2025 should not be hard to implement. Um, like I said earlier, go on our website, start playing for yourself, um, find out how good it is doing pretty much anything you can think of. And bring your credit card. And bring your credit card. No, give me a call. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lisa, same question for you. Um, I would say really it covers the last point of wherever you're thinking about where you're using Gen AI, think about how you get the best out of it by using a human oversight and the AI they're using as well. Perfect. Uh, Natalie, for you, is there anything about Salesforce that, you, that no one has said today that you would like to talk about? And then also what support should, what should we remember? <laughs> Just a catch all, if there's anything you think, crikey, yeah. no one's mentioned that. Um, but uh, but uh, that may be the thing to remember, but also otherwise, what's the most important thing to remember about Salesforce? Okay, I'll do the questions the other way around. So in terms of the kind of my, my closing comment on the subject of AI would be start with your use case. Don't try and have a mindset of, oh, I need to use generative AI in my business. You're not going to get the right results. We've never solutioned before we've identified the problem in um, software engineering in the past, and this is no different. So find out what your problem is or your use case to solve, and then find the right solution for that. That might be as simple as just an automation. It might be predictive AI, which we've been using for the last 10 years. It might be a data visualization, or it may well be Gen AI. But it's about having that blend of the right solution to solve the problem you're trying to solve, and then therefore get the value. In terms of what I would say about Salesforce specifically, it would be it's very, very possible and very easy to do this very quickly. We have a host of turnkey features, some of which are simply toggle on. It's so easy, and I hear so many people say, well, our, our data's not ready for it yet. You'd be amazed how good your data is for these types of use cases. If you have an account record and you're asking it to summarize that record, why not? Why not go ahead and use it? Start small, grow big, and try and use as many of our native turnkey features as possible so that you could do that and pace, at pace, grow trust in the platform, and then go and be more ambitious afterwards. Thank you. And so, and Go big, I think you said that somewhere. I mean, Salesforce is very big, so I'm assuming um, that someone can come track you down if they've got a question specifically about how <laughs> to uh, get involved in Salesforce. Absolutely. Yeah, happy okay. to help. Okay, well, you're far too nice to the panel, but we had some good case studies, so I'll let you off. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>